Welcome back to the Disaster Tough Podcast. I'm your host, John Scardina. I am so excited for this episode. If you recall, maybe a year, year and a half ago, we had uh, a great conversation with LAX talking about their emergency operations plans, all things emergency management from their perspective. But I have an awesome, awesome opportunity to talk to Penny Neferis. She is business continuity, number three, big top dog, head honcho. She's very, very cool. She's with JetBlue. She's going to come on to the podcast today to talk all things about building her program, basically from the ground up. She has an incredible background, and what she's done at JetBlue is just really special stuff. We're going to be talking today about taking care of your own, how JetBlue goes about that, and really setting up a model for other people to take. So without any further ado, I'm going to uh, have Penny come to the show. Penny, welcome. Hi, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So let's just kick it off. I, I know you have an incredible background, but you've been in JetBlue since the 1990s. You've been there what, um, coming up on 25 years. You are essentially an innovator from like the truest sense because you've had to come up with everything on your own. So can you walk through some of your uh, thought process when you got in? You're like, oh, I have to like kind of build this thing up to some of the initiatives that you have uh, brought into JetBlue. Sure. Um, great to be with you guys today. And so, yeah, I was there from the very beginning. When I joined, we didn't have a plane. We didn't have a name. Um, and But we knew we were going to build this exciting airline based out of New York. Um, and so early on, I started um, helping us get certified um, as an airline. But soon after, within about a year in, we, we really needed to have a dedicated emergency response team Um primarily focused on airplane accidents, which is heavily regulated for us. But that program really served us well in several uh, different aspects of response. Uh, early on, as you guys may recall, 2000, here we are, one-year-old, one-and-a-half-year-old company, and 9-11 happens in our backyard, and our industry is under attack. So, you know, kicking off our response plan, what little it was back then, maybe a 1,000 employees um, to – to respond and folks that were looking for loved ones uh, that really set the groundwork for us on who we were going to be. So facing those crises early on as a company, uh, the blackout, I mean, we can keep going, the storms <laughs> that played out um, really laid for us. Who, who do you want to be when it comes to response? And are you going to take care of your people? Are you going to take care of your community? And of course, you're going to take care of your business and your customers to get back up and running. But it really laid the foundation for us early on of who we were going to be. Yeah, it's an interesting perspective because like typically when we think of like airplanes and airplane crashes, we think of the survivors, we think of the victims, you know, whatever. But from an organizational standpoint, I can only imagine like, uh, if an airplane goes down from what other, you know, no matter the circumstance, right? Once a plane goes down, there's probably a hyper awareness of, do I want to fly? How does that impact the business? How do you make sure like business continuity continues from a messaging standpoint? And, and I do want to get to like how the organizational operates, but from a messaging standpoint, if there's an emergency that arises, i.e., you know, something happens where, you know, Malaysia air, airline goes down in the ocean or, a 9-11 Sully kind of movie comes out. How do you ensure the people who are working there and adjacent people who are aware of JetBlue to make sure that they can feel like, hey, we're doing everything we're supposed to to keep you safe, whether you work here or you're a customer? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, every opportunity, every crisis, whether it's aviation related or not, I think we can learn from and being, bring back. Uh, you know, I think back to the fleet grounding of the 737 Maxes and how it forced us to take a look uh, at what we what would we do and where would we put our planes and how would we respond? And so every single uh, crisis that happens, um, I would say that we don't also just focus on in our industry. Um, crisis happens all over the place. And even a tornado in the middle of Kansas, if we get alerted, we may have a pilot that lives there. And guess what? I don't want that pilot flying if his community is suffering as well as him so or her. So um, so it's important that it's really um, encompassing of all crises, mm -hmm. that we look at our plans, we dust the, you know, we don't just let them collect dust, that we bring them out, we test them. Yeah. 
uh, we drill to them, we tabletop them, we'll do functional exercises and live exercises. And then if we are responding uh, to events, I, I think about the Vegas shooting, you know, we'll set up in the Family Assistance Center. We've helped book families to get out, you Whoa. know, charge. Yet we also had a supervisor who was shot in the neck, you know. Um, so we were oh activating goodness. our team to respond as well to her. And then also bringing out a refresher active shooter training in person for the staff that work in that area. So it's kind of all encompassing, but the 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 crisis could be anything that we try and and not just focus on aviation but really any crisis that happens how do you how do you better your company's response real quick we're going to pause for this week's disaster tough endorsements the l3 harris extreme 400p radio solves problems and is specifically designed for emergency services how do we know we field tested it with medical urban search and rescue and collapse and confined structures this radio is amazingly tough Check out the L3 Harris Extreme 400P radio at L3Harris.com right now. How do you spell Doberman Emergency Management? EOP, OEP, HVA, HMP, Thyra, TTX, Drone, PDA. Whenever you need an expert, Doberman Emergency Management field experts are there for support. Contact an expert at DobermanEMG.com today. If you served in the military, you've probably worn Proper Apparel. Proper Apparel is now reaching out to first responders and those who love the outdoors. Check out Proper Apparel from the outdoors to the EOC, wear proper. Okay, let's jump back in. What is the relationship between uh, that angle where you're like, hey, we got to take care of our own? Uh, and by the way, when you told me that before we started recording, I'm like, oh, okay, she, like that's a good, like, you know, nice, nice thing to say. But then you're like, hey, there's a tornado in the area. We don't want that pilot to fly because we want to take care of that pilot. That's like a whole other level. Well, that's, that's just absolutely incredible. So good on you for that. But like when it comes down to like FAA, we had somebody from the Atlanta airport on here and they were talking about a tornadic event where, Tornado was on one side of the airport, and the airport is so huge that they actually had air, airplanes taking off on the other side because it was going to be such a disruption to aviation in general. How do you balance these things out where, you know, you, you essentially have these requirements that you have to meet, but you also want to keep people safe? And, like, how does that balancing act work, essentially? Yeah, so I think when it comes to the operation, um, you know, the FAA sets incredible very thorough regulations that we need to comply with, right? And so if they're going to shut an airport down, we're not flying. And so yeah. if they're opening, you know, so so it's easy from that aspect. Um, communicating to customers obviously is important as well. And so so I think our operations is dealing with those um, almost many events all day. Wow. Uh, things are happening. We're flying to over, you know, 100 plus cities, all, all, you know, over to Europe, down in South America and the Caribbean. And so things pop up all the time. And it it is when they'll trigger us when it's getting really significant. But they sure. deal with that stuff all the time. But we thankfully, we have, you know, really great regulations that we can follow to make sure we are keeping, you know, safety as the number one value for us. My, this is going to be a little bit of a shout out. But my father-in-law worked at Boeing for, I don't know, 40 years. He's retired. My brother-in-law is an airline pilot, and uh, they're also building their own plane. And the amount of detail and inspection that goes into even just like a Cessna, like the small plane, um, it, sometimes, I wouldn't say embarrassed, but sometimes I think emergency management, I don't know if we're as detailed or as analytical as I wish we were as an industry. Like, I, I understand from a data science perspective that, like, we could get there a lot more. But in your experience, because you've had to build up a program from ground up and understanding the intense regulations from FAA and looking at so much more data points that they look at for everything that you have to deal with every day as an industry, from an organizational standpoint or from an EM and organizational standpoint, do, is there like lessons learned that you think like, hey, are we missing the mark here? You know, I, for example, on this kind of a tangent, I saw just the other day someone said, hey, are we introducing too much technology already into EM? And I'm like, I don't think we're even close. Like, we're not even, like, it's not even the tip of the spear. Like, you're not even having data scientists yet looking at disasters and, and readiness. Yeah. I don't know. Do you feel the same way? Do you, do you feel like we're, we're getting there? Like, where where do you fall within that? Um. So two thoughts. One on the technology. I'm 100% with you. Um. I think more technology will only help us. 
um, for us, and I feel like relate to the game, but we finally launched electronic checklists this year, and it's been amazing, you know, to have yeah. paper backups, but like I can also see who's like might need a little knowledge or might need a little help. So, yeah. so from technology, I'm with you. Um, from uh, for our industry, crisis for a plane accident is very heavily regulated. So for us. Uh, putting together the family assistance legislation that really the NTSB runs for us and the Department of Transportation is fantastic because it literally states you are this agency and you are going to complete these tasks and you are this airline and you're going to complete these tasks. So from an ER perspective, when it comes to an airplane accident, Yes, I think it's very, very clear. Um, do I think we're that clear with other crisis events? No, I don't think so. Like active shooter, I still think is a little vague, you know, on like what's the expectation of a building or, you know, the landlord or, you know. Well, or the, who has standing and what's their responsibilities. Right? Yeah. yeah. So so I think, but from a plane crash perspective, I have to give credit. I mean, the, it is very clear. In fact, I guide other industries to go to the family assistance legislation because it is so clear on what to do to a fam for a family after an emergency. So if you are a company and have a headquarter and there's an explosion and you have fatalities, it is all spelled out in there. The airline screwed up so much in the 80s that legislation was passed that literally spells out straight from the family members saying, here's the, here's the support we needed. And so as wow. a result, we do have robust programs but other companies can piggyback off that and and build their own. Yeah, the you know just to grow on that topic, it's it's frustrating. I'm going to go back to that that same kind of sentiment. It's frustrating knowing that we can get there. Like I've seen it in other industries, and when I talk to a lot of emergency managers, they'll say things like, "I don't have buy-in from senior leadership," or you know, the stakeholders don't see like us as relevant, or you know, they complain. But then I start asking like really basic questions like when you present, you know, your your all hazards plan, which is not technically the, the probably the best term for everybody because they think doomsday prepping. But when you present your all hazards plan, like how are you presenting that? They're like, well, I come in there, you know, I'm the expert and I share my ideas. It's like, man, if you have some data to back you up, if you have like, you know, the checklist, like this is exactly what we're doing, where, where we need to meet and we're not meeting it. Here's like. You know, I, everything from negligence to just stupidity, like, hey, like we can get on top of this. Yeah. And like most of the time it's like wide eyed, like, oh, right. Like I didn't realize I should have like some historical data, like putting this together. Um, and from a technology standpoint, I had Vanessa Flores on here. She's the um, deputy director for University of California, Irvine. She, her UCI had hired our company to do a physical security assessment. And it was like groundbreaking ideas. The fact that we went in there, we built an app for them and we actually went room by room, geolocated all like, you know, we made a checklist of everything they were supposed to have. And we were able to present the findings and none of it was us. It was just like the data. You have this many rooms, this many tourniquets, this many AEDs, this many, like just like all the stuff. Like um, who knew that, you know, if you if you get that level of detail, I think you probably get a lot more trust out of people. I don't know. That's just kind of my two cents on it. But yeah, well, and I think that I always say, don't let a crisis like go to waste. You know, like if Ooh, you see I like that. if you see something happen out even in another industry, have that discussion. You know, whether you be, even if it's with your own leader and say, hey, you know, I I see this playing out. I'm seeing more active shooters at schools. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing more whatever the case is. Um, there is this little element of fear, <laughs> you know, when you bring that discussion and say, look, I, I feel the same fear. And I think we need to be discussing this a little bit more. So Ooh, I like that. Hey, yeah. you're that's a good line. Everybody should just re like rewind 10 seconds, memorize that line. I feel that a little bit, too. You just got you just put yourself on the same side of the table as them. You showed empathy. You're you're showing that you're realistic, even though the words a little bit shows that you're not freaking out so you're uh, man that is a master class in how to get people to do what you want to do so that line alone that's that's your that's your drop there if you've been at JetBlue for 25 years you've implemented all these things i would love for you to talk about those 40 minute uh tdx's that you throw at people in a second but obviously you're a very persuasive person just naturally it's coming off of so 
How do you do that? If you could teach emergency managers how to be a bit more persuasive, how do you address it? I would say the one thing, if you talk to anyone at JetBlue that comes across from myself or my team is that we are insanely passionate. Like mm -hmm. we are so dedicated to this. Like we come in every day thinking something bad might happen and we need to be ready to go. And I think where I've seen some teams elsewhere fail is folks that maybe have been put into this role and aren't really into it. Or, yeah. you know, you have people who are writing plans that don't like to write, you know, but like to do the exercise or the response part, you know? So, yeah. so yeah. Um, the passion, you know, I think comes through from all of us and uh, it's hard not to want to be part of our like boat, you know, <laughs> like, cause, yeah. Because we're just so dedicated. We're like, we really want to help your department respond better. And so here's a checklist we've built and we think we can maybe add some more to it. Let us help you. And so hmm. it really comes across as a win and not a stressor, as well as like, I'm going to help you and we're going to help the company and you're going to help my team. You know, so from that aspect, um, really, I think the passion, like they, they can't help but like jump on board because we're just going to keep like coming back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like how you say that with a smile. Like if you're listening right now, you might not understand, but <laughs> you're just like, hey, I'm just going to do this. I love people like that. I'm kind of that. Way. It's like you're like you're bullheaded, but in like the most fun and approachable way. Like nice. I will tell somebody is so funny with a client like. I've had some staff try to do it, and unfortunately, it fails epically when they try to do it. But I have I have this weird thing where I can tell somebody they suck to their face with the biggest smile on my face, and they'll take it, and we'll be best friends, and we'll go, and I'll have like somebody who is newer, like, oh, I see John do it. I think I can do that. They'll be like, you suck. You're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why'd you do that? And you're like, no, no, no. That's not the approach. Like, I'm just gonna keep coming back because this stuff is super important. I love the passion angle. Um, I'm going to give you another compliment. It's like the complimentary episode, but um, it's not just passion, right? It's obviously intelligence. Like you're, you're talking about, you like really know your craft. And I have seen people who are hyper passionate, but they're unteachable. They're, they, they cannot, they're unlearnable. And it's like, Hey, it's like that whole thing about the technology. I'm seeing all these comments of like, I don't want the more shiny thing. I don't want more technology. I'm like, but why? Like, what are you afraid of? Because, Ultimately, we need to get better at saving and sustaining life. My like one of my darkest moments of my career is when uh, you saw was talking about a four year old boy that got sucked out of a home and it was an uh, EF2 tornado. We know building code can protect against that. We we actually know how to basically fix that system. And yet that wasn't happening. And so it's like if we know the answer, we're not implementing it. We need to get better persuasion. Passion is allows you to get through a lot of the days of frustration, but ultimately, like when you get to the opportunity where you get to talk to whoever's in charge or the, getting that funding or whatever you need to do, that buy-in, like that intelligent piece comes in and obviously you're there. You talk about your team. I talk about teams. In terms of your team, um, what are the roles that you have found that are critical to actually being having a successful team? So our team is um, primarily divided into two. So we have an emergency response team for the airlines. It's all about airplane accident because it is so heavily regulated. There's a team just de dedicated. Think of it almost like as one plan. And so every city, whether it's Peru or Vancouver, has to be ready to go. They can have the emergency right now. And so they may only have a few people on staff. How are they responding? No different than JFK, where I have thousands. Um, so emergency response, ready to go. Uh, the uh, business continuity team, I say, does everything else. So every other crisis in the company that could happen is the teams. And they work cross-departmentally. They build BC plans. They build cross-departmental incident response plans. They run tabletops. Um but I would also say what's so important to uh, is the response team. So the incident directors, there are duty directors on the system operations floor, right? And so they can be responding to, you know, an active shooter has nothing to do with flying an airline, but hey, there's a response happening, you know, because of this crisis. And so uh, they're excellent in, in, in our crisis management team and participation and tabletops. All Everyone's dedicated. Everyone shows up like they take it that seriously so so i'm very lucky from that front i don't 
I don't really face a lot of resistance. The teams are, are fantastic across the board. Hey, we're going to do a quick pause X to thank our sponsors, L3 Harris, Proper Apparel, Impulse, Doberman Emergency Management, and all those subscribers who reach out to us and give us a donation to help us keep us going. Let's jump back in. Well, when my company fails, uh, I'll be happy to apply for a position like everybody else under the sun, but the, uh, it sounds like, awesome. you know, we'll take you. <laughs> yeah. Hey, oh, wow. What? All right. Interview. Jack, that was my secret for trying to do this interview. And also, uh, another shout out, I'm going to like, again, shout out episode, I guess, but Dan Dyer for connecting us on LinkedIn and, and learning more about you. But like, ultimately I'm trying to overcome this in- issue in our industry where, we have so many good things happening. I don't know if we are um, able to recognize as a field uh, the gaps very easily um, because there's so many different directions. And if you you have two teams, by the way, I have a random question about when you say emergency response for the airlines. If an airplane happens, this is a totally tangent for what I was just about to say. Air, airplane happens, airline crash, whatever happens at an airport. Is it the airport's responsibility or the airline's responsibility to respond to that? Do you have your own assets? You both respond. Okay. Well, so they put out the, they have requirements to respond within three minutes to, um, to the aircraft. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then when the victims come off, if they're survivors, um, that is coordination. Their EOC is critical. We have to be in their EOC. We respond to the site. So it's, both of us are activating our plans. And when they do their triennial airports um, exercises at the airports, we will participate as well uh, or another carrier. And then we, we may observe. So, um, yeah, those exercises are critical. Man, I would love to be able to see that sometime. Now, we've, we talked to a couple different airports. I mentioned LAX and Atlanta. I'd love to be able to see how um, that relationship and that coordination works. Um, but going back to the original thought of the gaps, uh, problem. You've had to be an innovator because, uh, I wouldn't say it's forced upon you, but getting into this space and you're like, oh, there's not a lot of best practice here. I mean, given airplanes haven't been up in the air for more than a hundred you know, years or so. Right. So, um, as you're being forced to build that out, um, what are the deficiencies that other people that you have noticed that maybe they haven't been, um, been aware of themselves because of that, uh, you know, the blinders on, if you're going to give it advice to the field, you're like, Hey, if you're working for an organization or you're working for airlines or whomever, what are the areas that often get overlooked that need to be corrected immediately? Well, I think one, again, I mentioned early on, we, we had nine 11 happen to us in our backyard and that really set the standard for us on how to take care of your own. Uh, we took that plane crash program that we had built and we knew what was expected on how to help the families or survivors. And we took that model and applied it to everything else. So if we had a fatality um, at work or, you know, or some, you know, someone passed away, we knew how to take care of the coworkers or their families and what might be needed. And that's then cascaded to hurricanes, to, you know, active shooters, tornadoes, you name it, uh, situations that have played out house fires, uh, Mm -hmm floodings, you name it, whatever it is, we've just taken that model to take care of your own. And I do think when a community especially is suffering as a company, if we could take care of our own, that's that many people less that the city and local folks and FEMA don't need to worry about. So, you know, if we could all do our part, how many thousands would be taken out of the system who maybe we provide them housing and we provide them food. Um, And, and it also goes so far, right? So the morale of feeling cared for by your employees, that's huge. There's, there's really no price for that. So my advice, if there's something everyone could do out there, if you don't do it already is really take care of your own people. I saw that, um, firsthand, uh, well, I guess it was technically secondhand, but I was at proper headquarters here in St. Louis. And uh, they were talking about how, like, literally the day after Hurricane Maria hit uh, Puerto Rico, um, they had a factory there. It was damaged. They couldn't get a lot of stuff done. Um, everybody showed up, and they still helped, you know, still just helped them. So they would it would have something to do. And JetBlue, it sounds like, you know, you, no wonder there's, like, quote-unquote, like, brand loyalty so, like, through and through. Dan, who I mentioned a second ago for everybody, 
he left like 10 years ago and he's obviously still like the biggest fan of JetBlue. And this shows like why from an EM perspective or a business continuity perspective, really, when you talk about that pilot in Kansas City with the tornado or you're talking about a hurricane, what is that reporting process? Do you know where essentially everybody is at all times? You're like, okay, the hurricane is, you know, 106, you know, hours out. But we know from the last like 10 years that hurricanes don't really strengthen until like the last 24 hours. Like, how do you, how do you figure out where people are at, get them out and choosing to or to not get them out? Yeah, great question. So we um, have an emergency notification system. It does track all our employees home address, whatever they have put in the HR database. Sure. And um, with that product, we get um, crisis alerting. So it will tell us if anyone in our, you know, at their home or in a corporate office, like something bad is happening nearby, it could be a crew hotel um, and they will alert us that something's going on. And so that then will trigger us to, hey, let's check in on them, see if they're okay, if they need assistance. Uh, and then communicate. So depending on the size, right, that one off with the one pilot, um, it may be just a message to the chief pilots and they'll reach out and, and offer support. In other cases, when it's a bigger response, like Hurricane Maria, we had 450 people on the island. Wow. We were going to do 100 percent reconciliation. We needed to hear from every single person. And in some cases, I had to send corporate security out to go find people. So um, so that's that cool. and then we report that up to leadership. So that's really also, I would say, another tip of mine is communicate what you're doing communicate like hey we sent an alert out here's the updates here's the progress we've made here's how much you know hotels we've given out here's the funding we've given out um yeah that really will help as well that's awesome yeah i, I try to think of like the organizations that i've heard of and honestly it's pretty pretty slim to like to be able to do that and the fact that you guys had not only do it but it sounds like you're doing it right in that reporting process from a mass notification standpoint, mass notifications, when it goes well, nobody ever talks about it. When it goes wrong, everybody talks about it. And from an, uh, specifically from an organizational standpoint, what is your approach on mass notifications? Like, I'll hear that, uh, I'll give my opinions maybe later, maybe not. But uh, some people never want to use it for anything else besides an emergency. People want to use it for like everything from like, hey, Friday afternoon, ice cream cart is coming around. <laughs> Like where, where do you fit in that? And maybe like, why do you, uh, why do you, what's your take on that? Yeah. Um, so it is, we are the administrators of the mass notification tool and it is primarily used for a crisis. Mm. However, other departments have reached out and we're like, we'll, we could really use this for overtime. Um, and to me, I'm like, that's kind of a crisis, right? Potentially, you know, sure. if we don't have enough staff. Yeah, gonna, yeah, to cancel. However, most of those cases are opt-in. So for us, everybody's in, but if you want to opt in to this alerting system for overtime, then they can opt in. Um, we'll we'll groups do it that way. Um, we've also shared it with a lot of our focus cities, so our bigger bases that like, if they want to push out evacuation alerts, you know, they can mm. take it from there as well. But yeah, for us, it is, it is not about check your email, you know, the latest newsletter is out. That is not it. That is yeah. not. I like, I like the, it's like kind of the combination approach where it has to be used for emergencies. And if it's used too much, people are going to opt out yeah. and they're going to like just ignore it. And so it has to be relevant and, and, and used. But I'm also a fan of people realizing that this is a tool that they can use for rare but positive events. And also it's a good way to like see open rate and all that other kind of stuff that happens with it. Some get some good data points. And so uh, I like how you... Uh, despite being the administrators and caring about the emergencies are allowing different departments to use it for real world use cases that maybe not be, you know, overly used as well. Yeah, so and a minimal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, from the air air uh, or the pilots perspective, I know that they have to respond um, or if they get a response on like overtime, they have to show up like those. Are, that's like a, a you know different industry thing. So um, there's all these different angles of how to approach it airplanes and airline industry is, is so unique because of the regulations and because the emerging industry and because, you know, there's only three or four, maybe five like major competitors in the space from that perspective, because it's emerging, because your competitors are well known and you know each other and you have to protect your business, but at the same time, create best practices. 
how does your relationship work with the other airlines? Do you share? Do you not share? Yeah. Where do you fit in that? Um, this is one area of the business where there is no competition. So awesome. we love that. We love that about it. Us, you know, that we can get together. We work closely. Um, if something was to happen, you know, in Dallas, I wouldn't hesitate to reach out to Southwest or American and vice versa. They'll call yeah. upon me. Um, again, when it comes to crisis in our industry, we all feel it. Um, we all see what's playing out and, and want to just offer our support whether it's domestically or around the world, the carriers do get together once um, a month. And mm. uh, during the pandemic, it was once a week, but you know, <laughs> once a month and just talk through like, Hey, what are some events that are coming up or crisis that we've dealt with? Uh, we share just exercises that we're running, or if we're hosting an exercise with an airport authority, we'll share that as well. Mm. Uh, but there's no competition in, in, in our space, which is nice. That's awesome. That's huge. And that's how it should be. Honestly, like mm -hmm. I, I'm kind of sick of like, people thinking that somehow there's like not enough to go around. There's so many things that we could address. So there's a lot of good, like low hanging fruit. And if you figure out how to do things right, like you're doing right, taking care of your own, like people should hear that. And, you know, I'm grateful for you coming on the podcast and just sharing it. I guess I can't really ask you the competition question because if you're talking about it publicly on a podcast, you probably should be pretty fine with it. But um, the reality is like you have uh, as an innovator, as a leader, doing things right at JetBlue, if you're talking to a generation who's just getting out of college or people are just trying to find EM for whatever reason, different career paths or otherwise, what are maybe three or four things that you would suggest to them? You're like, hey, you got to knock this out of the park in, in order to make a, a splash in a positive way. Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, there's so many opportunities to volunteer or be part of an exercise. I mean, I, there's so many that are going on, whether, you know, any any efforts that you make to show your engagement and your passion in this field, whether you become a CERT volunteer, whether you become a Red Cross volunteer, that's all going to look great. But it also gives you experience, right? You're responding. Um, exercises, you call your airport authorities, they're always looking for volunteers. <laughs> you know, we always need people to be an actor. And so getting that also on your resume just shows that you're giving up of yourself and your time to uh, get more experience. Internships are huge. Get out there, do some internships. Um, you know, and, and I think being able to write and communicate and work with others is instrumental. So if you're able to show that, you know, you've, you've done stuff in, in your college or in your university where you have put together an exercise or you've wrote a plan, that's, those are huge wins when, you know, we're looking at candidates. You just gave me a very big problem that I don't know how to overcome. I'm going to have to figure it out. When this podcast airs next week, the day after, I'm giving the keynote speech at the Florida Hazmat Symposium. It's the largest hazmat uh, conference in the country that I'm aware of. And part of that keynote is I'm going through uh, different styles of leadership that I really appreciate that can be used in the field. My presentation's done and ready to go, but you just like put a big kink in that because now I have to redo my presentation it's all going to be about Penny and her advice and for the field. Seriously, it's it's really great stuff. I if, I will have to ask your permission afterwards, but I might actually grab a quote from this podcast and share it because like taking care of your own, being an innovator, collaborating. I'm a big fan of also getting to the, the field. Uh, you know, I was a volunteer at the Red Cross. That's how I started. And just like doing something for your community, man, it was such a difference when I got out of college like classmates who like weren't involved in the community didn't do the response stuff they didn't really understand that versus like having some of that experience you know i wasn't a you know i wasn't a firefighter but i showed up at in you know, numerous house fires i was able to help out survivors mm -hmm. and doing something showing that you just don't care about yourself is huge and um that goes back to servant leadership which is um, another man talk about compliments uh i would love to work for you if everything crashes and burns here but i hope nothing does and I You're hope that for JetBlue too. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so with that, Penny, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast and chatting with me. Is there anything else that you want to share before we get out of the podcast? No, I mean, thanks to everyone who's out there doing this field. Um, it really, you know, we, we make an impact. Each one of us out there doing our doing our work. So keep doing what you're doing. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. I was trying to think of a dad pun while you're saying that something like you're taking off on this amazing thing. I'm sure you hear all the puns, but 
seriously, uh, Penny, thank you so much for coming on. If you got something out of this podcast episode, if you were listening to this conversation, if you rewound the section I told you to rewind, then uh, do all those things. There are so many quotes from this, so many ideas that you could take from this to be successful. I've seen that over here at the Readiness Lab. I've seen it with other friends. If you want to be an innovator, you got to learn how to persuade people. You have to learn to take care of your own. You have to learn how to do things right and ha- keep that passion while it's still being teachable, which is obviously what they're doing at JetBlue. So if you got something out of this episode, again, like and subscribe, all that stuff. But if you've done something like Penny's talking about where it's actually helped out the field, put it in the comments of the Readiness Lab. Help us learn, you know, help us do it together. And with that, uh, if you're at the Hazmat Symposium this week and if you're listening to this podcast, uh, you can find me. I'll give you a challenge coin, the whole deal. And we'll see you for next week. Peace.